Well, good morning. Welcome once again to our study in the book of Colossians. My name is Pastor John Bolger, and we have been studying the scriptures. So I invite you to pray along with me as we complete our study in the book of Colossians. Yes, this is a monumental day because we are completing chapter 4. So please join me in prayer. And Lord, thank you again for a wonderful time in your word. We anticipate it. We've seen it in our past studies. We look forward to what you will teach us today according to your will. Thank you, Father. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are looking at the closing of the epistle to the Colossians. And as I read chapter 4, verses 7 through 18, it will remind us that this originally was a letter written to a certain group of people. We will see that. So follow along with me as I read, beginning in verse 7. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of our mem- uh, one of our number, A bondslave of Jesus Christ sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and also Nympha, and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. As I told you, this reminds us that this letter was written to the believers at Colossae, but we find also what I might call the mundaneness of letter writing. Usually, letters just disseminate information. I think of a couple of letters that I have in my uh, possession When my mother was born many years ago, she was the first grandchild, and uh, her mother, excuse me, her grandmother wrote my mother's mother, if that makes sense, congratulating her and wanting news about the birth of the first grandchild. Also, my, uh, my grandmother's sister, so my mother's aunt, wrote a letter as well. She would have been a young lady probably in her 20s, and so there was much excitement, and these people lived in rural West Texas. Uh, And uh, when you read the letters, there's this basic information about who has done what and who has been visited and who has visited who and what's going on in so-and-so's farm and what have you, uh, along with information or requesting information about the birth of the baby granddaughter. We think those type of letters are quaint, but that's typical for a letter. It's, it's returning information and giving information. Well, Paul has done this, but on a much grander scale because he has brought forth the mysteries of Christ and focused on the works in the person of Christ. Remember, that has been his focus. He's addressed the false teaching that has been found in Colossae, but he's also exalted Christ. And we've seen in chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 4, how he's reminded us of the, the, uh, the centrality of Christ, which needs to be in our lives, living a Christ-centered life. And so 
Today, Paul closes his epistle, his epistle, excuse me, with some personal instructions and greetings from his fellow workers. Now, remember that Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. It also parallels, and we haven't mentioned this much, we've mentioned that Ephesians was written also from prison, from prison, excuse me, most likely at the same time, so there's a lot of themes and a lot of similar language. Paul wrote another letter that was sent along with this letter to the Colossians to one important person at the Church of Colossae, and that would be Philemon. Yes, the small letter of Philemon was also written during this time, and we will see that particularly today, even as we close our letter. By the way, Paul mentions more people in this epistle uh, than any other of his letters, except Romans, which has many, many people. This one has... Oh, my, forgive me, I don't have the exact number, but uh, let's see, six fellow workers plus Tychicus and Onesimus and some other people, at least 10, 10 to 15. Well, in any case, let's remind ourselves about the book that was written, this epistle of Colossians. Remember, Colossae was located at the Lycus, in the Lycus Valley in Phrygia in ancient Asia Minor, that would be modern-day Turkey. It was on the south bank of the Lycus River. There were two other more important cities that it made it sort of a, a tri-city complex, a triumvirate. Hierapolis was one of those cities, 15 miles northwest, and Laodicea was 12 miles west. They were both nearby. Those two cities were more prominent. Colossae was more in the backwater. It's past it had been more prominent it was more of a backwater town by the way all three of these towns were about 100 miles east of Ephesus I remind us as well that it's likely very likely that the church at Colossae was started it was founded and pastored by Epaphras remember Paul had never been to the church at Colossae uh, as far as we know then he wouldn't have evangelized even people that went there but back in chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, let's remember what Paul has written. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, the, the gospel, that is, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Epaphras has come to Paul while he's in prison in Rome to give him a report about the church at Colossae. This is Paul's response, the letter that's going to be sent back, not by Epaphras, who's going to stay with Paul for some time. We'll see who it's sent back with. Also, chapter 2, verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Remember, Paul had not, met, had not been to the church at Colossae. Perhaps he had met some of the people in his travels, but he had not actually been to the church. So today, as we look at this, the end of this book, we will see closing remarks, but also the Christ-centered relationship in Paul's life. You know, sometimes it may seem difficult to exegete a passage in an epistle like this when there's not major doctrines, there's not major duties. It's simply information about who people are, greetings given and taking, but we can still see the dynamic of the relationships that Paul had with people that he knew intimately and those that he didn't know intimately. Well, if you're taking notes, it's just our, our, um, our time in God's Word is going to begin. Point number one, verses seven through nine, we're going to look at two important people, Tychicus and Onesimus. Again, back in verse seven, Paul says, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. Tychicus had been commissioned to send Paul's letter to the church of Colossae. He was the letter bearer. In those days, they didn't have postmen and mailmen. People sent letters personally if they were traveling. Sometimes that meant it took a long time before you received a letter. Now, I want you to notice uh, Tychicus' Tychicus's 
that's sort of a mouthful, to say Tychicus' prominence in the early church, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 21, Paul says, But that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Tychicus not only was the letter bearer for the Colossian epistle, but also for the Ephesian epistle. Now I want to take us back even farther to see Tychicus's connection to Paul. Turn to Acts chapter 20, and we find ourselves during Paul's third missionary journey, and he has just left Ephesus where there was a big uproar where the idol worshippers threw Paul and his people out of the city. And then it says, verse 1 of chapter 20, after the uproar, that is in Ephesus, had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. That would be northern Greece. He's in western Asia Minor. Now he's going to northern Greece. When he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, most likely in Corinth. And when the plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return to Macedonia. He went back up to northern Greece, and he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus, and Secondus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, his son in the faith, and Tychicus, here's our man, and Trophimus of Asia. So Paul had quite an entourage of people that traveled with him, traveling companions, and one of them was Tychicus. You turn over to Titus chapter 3, verse 12. Paul has sent this letter to Titus, another one of his fellow workers, in Crete to get things going with the church there. He says in verse 12, chapter 3, When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. The implication is that Titus was going to appoint elders and do some other things there at the, with, with the churches in Crete, and Paul considered sending Artemis or Tychicus to replace him, perhaps his pastor. So he was a prominent person in the early church, a faithful, reliable fellow worker. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, this is Paul's final letter that he wrote. This is his second imprisonment. We are in Colossians in Paul's first imprisonment. He will eventually be released, minister for a few years, then he will write 2 Timothy. That will be his final letter where he's in prison again, and that time after that he will die. He will be put to death. 2 Second, uh, Timothy 4.12 But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, So again, Tychicus is a part of Paul's life for many years, a trusted fellow co-worker. We look at the major ones like Titus and Timothy, but even these lesser-known people, all we know for sure about what Tychicus did is that he was a letter-bearer, the postman who was needed to serve Paul the Apostle, and he did it faithfully. Paul continues back in verse 8 of Colossians 3, excuse me, Colossians 4. He says, For I have sent him, Tychicus, to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He was a godly man. This word encourage, parakaleo, to exhort, to comfort, to come alongside. He was not just going to drop off the letter and then leave. He was going to minister to the Colossians. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. And remember, Paul is in prison, so Tychicus is going to give a report, an update about how Paul is doing. 
Look what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, another prison epistle. He says in verse 12 of chapter 1, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Well, that's a sanctified rabbit trail. Paul was saying that God was being glorified in his imprisonment. He preferred being there, as it were, than being free. Nevertheless, we know what took place later on in history. Still in Philippians chapter 2, verse 24, Paul says, I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Paul seems to imply that he's not going to be imprisoned very long. And then if you go to Philemon, verse 22, he says, At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Paul anticipated his immediate release, and we know from history that that took place because he went on to write other books. But Tychicus was not the only person that went to... Re- went to deliver Paul's letter to the Colossians. Verse 9, he says, And with Tychicus, Onesimus. And look how he describes him, because he uses the same language or similar language that he does for Tychicus. Our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. That is, he's a fellow Colossian. They will inform you about the whole situation here. And we're going to get into this, Lord willing, when we have a brief study in the book of Coloss- Excuse me, Philemon. Philemon had been a slave, unconverted, a slave of, of excuse me, Onesimus. I'm going to get my people straight. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon. Philemon was his master. Philemon was a believer. Onesimus wasn't. Onesimus escaped, ran all the way to Rome. Perhaps he thought he could hide in a large city. He sovereignly, uh, providentially, God put him in contact with Paul where he was converted. He became an assistant, helped minister to Paul while he was in prison. Now Paul is sending him back, and that is why Onesimus is going with Tychicus. Let me give you what he says in Philemon, beginning in verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. Onesimus' name means useful. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I have wished to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul is telling uh, uh, Philemon, because there needs to be some reconciliation here, You need to be willing, Philemon, to forgive Onesimus, who indeed ran away from you. He sinned against you. But those circumstances allowed him to become converted, to become saved, and now he's returning to you, not just as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. This is a win-win situation. Colossians 3.11. Remember what Paul said about believers. The renewal, the regeneration in our conversion, in our becoming Christians, is that which, in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. You are being returned, Paul says to Philemon, a beloved brother in Christ is coming to you. And so there was anticipation, although I'm sure Onesimus had a few butterflies in his stomach. How would Philemon respond? 
Would he indeed be forgiving or would he be angry? And that's why Paul wrote this personal letter to Philemon to sort of soften the reconciliation to help smooth it along. Well, we've seen Tychicus and Onesimus who are the letter bearers. Next, we'll see six fellow workers that are with Paul while he is in prison in Rome. And it's not 100% clear that they are all in prison with him. They were close by. Paul was in some sort of a house arrest, so he had some freedom, according to Acts 28. He did have a Roman guard chained to him, but he had some freedom as far as visitors and that sort of thing. So the six fellow workers, we've already read it earlier, and I'll come back to it, but I want to read Philemon, verses 23 and 24, which is the end of this little letter, because you're going to notice some of the same names. Epaphras, he says, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. In fact, five of the six people mentioned in Colossians 4 are also mentioned in those two verses in Philemon. That also gives us proof that they were written at the same time and sent together. Paul begins the first of the six, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greeting. Now, you might say, well, obviously he's telling us that Aristarchus is in prison. Perhaps it is, although sometimes Paul seems to use that designation, my fellow prisoner, when the person may not actually be incarcerated with him. Perhaps a prisoner of Christ, enslaved, chained to Christ. But in any case, Aristarchus is with him. We find him also in the book of Acts, traveling with Paul. Remember I read Acts 19? Oh, excuse me, I read Acts 20. But in Acts 19, verse 29, when they were in Ephesus, remember I told you the uproar that Paul caused when he preached the gospel, upset the idol worshipers. It says the city was filled with confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. They were northern Grecians, Macedonians. I already read chapter 20, verse 4. After they left the uproar in Ephesus, that was uh, Aristarchus was one of the people with him. Now in chapter 27 of Acts, verse 2, it says, And embarking in an Andromitian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. Aristarchus was with Paul when he traveled to Rome sometimes called the fourth missionary journey. It wasn't really a missionary journey, so to speak. But Paul went to Rome, and so Aristarchus, again, is one of those lesser lights, but yet an important minister to Paul as he traveled around. We don't know much about him beyond what the text tells us, of course. He was from Macedonia, and that text in in Acts 27 says he was from Thessalonica. Secondly, Paul mentions also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Well, this is the famous John Mark that is mentioned a number of times in the book of Acts. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 12, before Paul becomes prominent, beginning right after he was converted. So Peter is still a prominent figure in the book of Acts. Peter had been in prison for the gospel, and there was a group of believers praying for him. And in Acts 12, 12, it says, When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. There was a group of believers in John Mark's mother's house. Her name was Mary. Perhaps there was a church that met at her house. And then in chapter, verse 25 of that same chapter, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. You might notice there that in our text, it tells us that Barnabas was Mark's cousin. So it makes sense that Barnabas would have maybe encouraged Paul to let us take Mark along 
and on their it, what turned out to be their first missionary journey. Now go over to chapter 13, verse 5. And we're in the first missionary journey. It says, When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they also had John, that is, Mark John, as their helper. Then in verse 13, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. He actually deserted Paul and Barnabas and returned to Jerusalem. For whatever reason... Maybe the ministry was too much for him. Maybe he had a bad experience. Maybe he had a fallout, a falling out with someone. Could have been Paul, most likely Paul. For whatever reason, he deserted the ship and went back to Jerusalem. Then we come to chapter 15 of Acts, which is the second missionary journey. And verse 36 says, After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him also. Remember, they're they're blood, they're cousins. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted, deserted them in Pamphylia, and did not and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the, the brethren to the grace of the Lord, and he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. There was a rift between those workers. Barnabas took Mark, Paul took Silas. Nevertheless, when you come later, many years later, I think the figure is at least 10 years later, a reconciliation has taken place. Because now we find ourselves in 2 Timothy. This is at the end of Paul's life. Well, I already noted how Paul commends, excuse me, Mark. He says, if he comes to you, welcome him. So they were on good terms, obviously. 2 Timothy 4.11 Paul says, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you. Listen to this, for he is useful to me for service. Reconciliation had taken place. Mark was once again serving the body of Christ by ministering to Paul. Also, notice, of course, he's listed in the group of people in Philemon. That, of course, parallels Colossians. And then in 1 Peter, chapter 5, Peter of the Lord's apostles, says in verse 13, he says, she who is in Babylon, most likely a cryptic reference to Rome, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, that's most likely the church in Rome, sends you greeting, and so does my son Mark. Mark had a close discipleship relationship with Peter. Peter discipled Mark. And if you're familiar with, with your authors of the New Testament, Mark, the Gospel of Mark was written by this very same man, John the Mark, John the Mark, John Mark. So he was a another prominent person in the New Testament church. Had some troubles at one point with Paul, but reconciled with him and continued on to minister faithfully to the point that he was a writer of one of the Gospels. Next, number three, verse 11, it says, Also Jesus, who is called Justice. This word named Jesus is common in the New Testament. He has another name, Justice. This is the only time he's mentioned in the New Testament, so we know nothing about him. He's the one that's not mentioned in Philemon, not mentioned in Acts, anywhere else. But Paul gives us a little more information about him. In the rest of verse 11, he says, These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus, who is called Justice, were Jewish believers. Remember, Paul makes the point, Jew and Gentile are one in Christ, so all these people were ministering to him, Jew and Gentile. We continue on, verses 12 and 13, the fourth out of the six, 
Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete and fully assured in all the will of God. Remember that Epaphras most likely founded the church at Colossae. He was most likely also their pastor. Notice how he's described. He labored earnestly for the Colossians in his prayers. That means to, to struggle literally to agonize. And his prayer was this, that, they, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. In other words, Epaphras was praying an appropriate prayer that a pastor would pray for his flock, that they would be mature spiritually, that they would be mature believers. Paul continues, For I testify to him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Epaphras ministered not only the church of Colossae, perhaps he was an itinerant pastor. He had flocks in Hierapolis and Laodicea, or perhaps he just knew believers there, but he had an influence in that whole area. Now go back to chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, which I've already read, but I'll read it again. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love and the Spirit. This godly man came to Paul in Rome while he's in prison to minister to him, to inform him about the church in Colossae. And Paul notes his great concern to the believers there. Now, look down at verse 28 of chapter 1 of Colossians. This is Paul's Concerned. This is Paul's prayer for the Colossians. He says, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have in your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. Paul says down in verse 28 and 29 that his goal for every believer that he ministers to is that they would be complete in Christ, that they would be mature believers. And so he says in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2 that even though I haven't been to your church personally and I don't know most of you personally, still my goal is that you would be spiritually mature, that you would be strong in the faith. And guess what? That was Epaphras' prayer too. So Epaphras and Paul are on the same page. Every pastor who is worth his salt must pray regularly and faithfully for his flock that they would grow spiritually. If you're a pastor and you're listening to this message, that should be your goal, to see your flock complete in Christ. Now Philemon, verse 23, I'm just mentioning this because... Uh, he is mentioned prominently in Philemon. It says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. And again, this is why I mentioned it's not clear that Epaphras was actually in prison with Paul, but he's called a fellow prisoner, maybe because of his close connection to Paul. Matthew Henry says this about Epaphras' powerful intercessory prayer regarding the flock in Colossae. It says, those who would succeed in prayer must take pains in prayer, and we must be earnest in prayer, not only for ourselves, but for others also. It is the effectual, fervent prayer which is the prevailing prayer and availeth much. James 5.16. The work of the ministry as an agonizing, painful, laborious Endeavor, as I know personally from pastoring and helping to start churches. Pastor or minister, if you're listening or watching this, do you pray for your flock regularly for their growth spiritually? Do you pray that God would grow the church? That it would be His church, not your church? 
If you're not a pastor or minister, do you pray for your pastor? Do you pray for your church, your local body, that it would grow, that it would be complete, perfect in Christ? It's important for us to do that. Finally, number five, verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. We know about Luke because he also wrote the Gospel of Luke. This is the same Luke. He was a physician by trade. Many believe that he was Paul's personal physician because we find him with Paul in Acts 16 on a second missionary journey and also in chapter 20 in the third missionary journey and also in chapter 27 and 28 on the, the journey to Rome. He was on the boat with with Paul. So many believe that he was with Paul all the time because of his uh, apparently manifold uh, uh, physical ailments. Luke is mentioned, as I said, in Philemon verse 24 and also in 2 Timothy 4.11. He was the only one that stayed with Paul when he was in prison. And then finally, number six, Demas. Demas is mentioned. Nothing is said about him except that he greets, sends his greetings. He's also mentioned in Philemon. But sadly, there's a sad subscript, a postscript to Demas. When we come to 2 Timothy, Paul's second imprisonment, I'll just read all these verses because you'll get the context. Paul says, make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus, Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me, the beginning of verse 11. Paul was in prison. Paul knew that his time on this earth was short. He sent some of his fellow workers to other places, but it says Demas left him, departed. What a sad, sad story. But at this time, he is a fellow worker while he, Paul is in the, uh, the prison in Rome for his first imprisonment. But one thing, I don't know if you noticed this, so in Paul's company is Mark, John Mark, and also Luke. And one writer makes the note that in this Roman confinement then, there was united the authors of 155 out of the 260 chapters of the New Testament, or about 60% of the total. Isn't that amazing? Paul, John, Mark, and Luke were all together in Rome while Paul was in prison. And then finally, verses 15 through 18, we find some closing instructions. Paul says, verse 15, Greet the brethren who were in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. Apparently there was a close connection particularly to the believers in Laodicea. Perhaps many of them were part of the house church in Colossae. Maybe there wasn't a church in Laodicea. We don't know. But actually that may be incorrect because it's very likely that Nympha had, uh, there was a church and this is a lady, so a church met in her house. Chapter 2, verse 1. Remember again, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have in your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. There's a close connection between Colossae and Laodicea. By the way, look again at Philemon, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Athia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. So it's very likely that the house church that met in Colossae, Epaphras was the pastor, Philemon was the host, and very likely Athia was his wife, and Archippus was either a leader in the church or perhaps his son, or perhaps both. Yeah, so that statement, let me re re-say that statement regarding Nympha and the church that is in her house. Philemon had a house church in Colossae, most likely pastored by Epaphras, and there was a house church in Laodicea that met in the home of Nympha. This was the common 
place before churches had buildings. Romans 16.5, 1 Corinthians 16.19 mentioned that as well. Verse 16, Paul continues, When this letter, the one I'm writing to you, is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Now, interesting. These were circular letters. Paul wanted the people at Colossae to, to have this letter read, and then it was to be sent to the Laodiceans. You look in 1 Thessalonians 5.27. Paul says, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. It was read publicly. People didn't have copies of their own, at least initially. Not everybody could read, and so information was disseminated by verbally communicating. Now, this second letter that's mentioned in verse 16, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. There's been much discussion regarding this, but it's very likely that this is actually Paul's letter to the Ephesians. There is some historical evidence that it initially it was circulated among a bunch of churches in Asia Minor, so that would make sense. If it's not Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it's a lost letter unknown to us. This shouldn't unsettle us. Uh, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, at least another letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth that we don't, know, don't have. Paul, not every letter that Paul wrote was inspired scripture, and no doubt he wrote many letters, perhaps hundreds, to individuals and people in churches. And then in verse 17, another interesting little comment. He says, Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Now remember, Archippus is mentioned in Philemon verse 2. He was either Philemon's son, because of the way he is mentioned right after Philemon and Aphia, or he would have been a prominent leader or an up-and-coming leader in the church. He is also mentioned in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Oh no, excuse me, (laughs) I'm wrong. Let me read 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. Paul says to Timothy, But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul is encouraging Timothy to be consistent and faithful in your ministry. He had a lot of work to do. He was young. He might not have been respected by all the people in the church. So apparently, Archippus, we don't know the details of this, but it sounds like Archippus is entering the ministry or he's already in the ministry. He needs to be encouraged. Paul's saying, if you've been called, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord. If the Lord has given you the call to the ministry, the talents and the affirmation and the desire, fulfill that ministry. We don't know the details, if he was slacking off, if he was fearful, or maybe it was just a reminder as he was beginning a ministry, be faithful. Ministry will not, will, not, will not always be easy. And you look at the situation of the church in Colossae, they had the Colossian heretics to deal with, perhaps other issues, just dealing day-to-day with people and their lives. So his archipus, work hard, don't be discouraged. And it's interesting because Epaphras is now in Rome with Paul. Perhaps Archippus was the main man when he, in the church in Colossae. But in any case, he needed to be encouraged, and so Paul does that. Finally, Paul closes verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Paul was noted for having an amanuensis, someone who he would dictate his letter to, but then at the very end of his letter, he would would, uh, write a greeting to show people that he had indeed penned this letter. 1 Corinthians 16.21, This greeting is in my own hand, Paul. 2 Thessalonians. 3.17. 3.17. I, Paul, write this letter with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write Philemon, verse 19. 
Paul says, I, Paul, am writing this letter with my own hand. I will repay it. He's talking about the debt that Onesimus owed Philemon. Perhaps Paul wrote all of Philemon himself. It was just a short letter. Galatians 6.11, Paul very forcefully says, See with what letter, large letters I write. In other words, the Galatians might have, for some reason, suspected that Paul hadn't written the letter in case, because he's so... The, the tone is so strong and rebuking. Paul says, no, yes, it was me, and I've written. You need to get things settled, straightened out, and stop being influenced by the Judaizers. So even in the closing of this wonderful epistle, we see Paul's love for the Lord. We see his love for other believers his influence and involvement in so many people's lives, the significant people that were a part of Paul's entourage, Luke, Mark, Aristarchus, Epaphras, Tychicus, Onesimus, these people's names have been preserved down through history to remind us that a a successful, fruitful ministry is not just one, it's not a one-man show, there are many godly men and women that need to be involved in the work of the ministry. Regarding these relationships, if you're in the ministry, do you have these type of Christ-centered relationships? Do you have fellow workers that can be relied on? Or perhaps, are you a faithful fellow worker in the body of Christ? Guess what? Your pastor needs you. Even if you're not a leader, even if you're not a, a fellow preacher or a teacher or a song leader, or maybe you don't have any uh, uh, prominent role in the church, but if you are there to support and to pray for, minister to your pastor and to the leaders, do that. Relationships focused on Christ will be strengthening and edifying. Remember, the body of Christ is is just that, many cells, many parts together working to edify one another. Folk, uh, uh, relationships focus on, on ourselves, or when we're too focused on another person, those can be frustrating. In other words, if we're all focused on Christ, remember uh, chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, the Christ-centered life. Christ is the center of our lives. We have been saved by the work we see what Christ did on the cross and we are saved and the foundation of Christ is how we grow in our faith in Christ it's all about him don't even let your dear relationship with fellow believers or with your pastor or your elders don't let that distract you they also seek to follow Christ you follow Christ along with them in their manner Friends, sometimes words don't come well to me. I describe things imperfectly, but let us remember our focus must be on Christ, as Paul has told us in this marvelous letter. I pray that each of you have been encouraged by this letter, and if you haven't listened to any of these messages, maybe just this one, go back and read the epistle to the, to the Colossians so that you can learn more about Paul's heart heart for ministry and for the Lord and also watch these other messages so that they would encourage you and friend if you don't know Christ if this is a mystery to you I pray that God would open your eyes that you would see your sinfulness and that you would turn from your sin and embrace Christ so that you can be a fruitful member of his body right right now if you don't know him you are outside of the body You are not a member of the body of Christ. Friend, turn from your sin today, this very hour, this very minute, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you. And trust in Him for your salvation. Place your faith and trust in Christ. And let's pray. Let's close our time. Lord, thank you again for this time. Oh, what a short little uh, book, uh, epistle of four chapters, but so much wonderful meat, so much wonderful, uh, so many wonderful things that we've learned in our study. I thank you for helping me to know more about what it means to have a Christ-centered life as a pastor, uh, 
You shouldn't just preach about these things. You should live them as well. Help me to be a godly leader and a godly example to others. And I pray for all of those out there who have heard this message. I pray that you would help them to be more complete, to be stand firm in Christ, as Paul says in chapter 1, to be perfect and complete. Paul's desire was to present every man and woman complete in Christ. That would be my desire for all those that I influence. And I pray that that would be all of our desires personally, to be mature in Christ. Thank you for this reminder, Father. And it's in your Son's blessed and holy name who makes that relationship possible. Amen. Well, friends, we've closed our time in the book of Colossians, and you're saying, well, what next? What next? Well, you know that we have done a number uh, earlier, we have done a number of selected studies in the book of the Psalms. And so we will continue to do that, and the Lord will provide other opportunities. The, the Bible has 66 books. I haven't decided where I'm going to go next, but at least... Until we do another book study, we will continue in Psalms when the Lord provides opportunity. Thank you again for joining us. Praise God for you. If this has encouraged you, I pray that you would thank God, praise Him first of all, and then encourage others by what you've learned. The Lord bless you. Have a good day. Goodbye.